Gabriel, can I start off asking questions about your early family life? Because it's something I don't know very much about, except that your father was a tailor. What was your father like? Lovely chap. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely lovely man. He was about five foot five, and um, he was round, and he was, he was a very kind man. Um, he was certainly very kind to us children. Uh, devoted to my mother. Uh, always worried if my mother had to go shopping. Um, because she might just be late, and uh, an absolutely lovely person. Uh, and he died when I was quite young, when I was about 17. But uh, yes, it was a, he was a very lovely person. And your mother? Oh, she was wonderful too, but my, <laughs> my poor mother had... <laughs> my poor mother, who was... It's just that she was a wonderful mother, but she had a terrible job to do, because uh, my father was a tailor and the times were bad and we lived under rather uh, cramped conditions. And toward the end of his life uh, we lived in a house which I think was rented and it was damp and the ceilings were peeling and the wallpaper was peeling, the war was on. Uh, my father was getting very ill um, yet he had to work all the time to earn a living. My brothers were going away, their parents were very upset, and my mother had to help him in the shop, help him with the tailoring, tailoring uh, look after me and my other brother, and, uh, and these great struggles that took place uh, during the years of the war, I think, were awful for her. But she kept us all together. Hmm. How much older or younger than you were your siblings? Well, my oldest brother was about nine years older than me, and my next one up was... I think three, three, that's right. There were three other brothers, all older than me. And, and that was the three and eight and I think nine years. Right. Do you remember anything of your grandparents? Only one. I mean, I, I had a... Uh, the, the, my, 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 my mother was born in the East End of London in um, a place called Cavill Street, just off Commercial Road. And uh, from Birmingham, we use on... Some days, some Sundays, I think we'd take the day off and occasionally go and see her. And I hated going to see her. It was not that I disliked her. It was merely that the extreme poverty that I saw there was just just awful. Uh, it was a block of flats and it was... Cambridge brick as it worst, as it worst, as it were, you know, covered in soot. And, and they live up the top of many flights of stairs and it was dark. And uh, she uh, lived in this flat with an older son, old son, who uh, he was always unemployed, as far as I can tell. And um, the place was dirty. I think she probably tried quite hard, but it, it, it was, you could see poverty reaching out of everything. So it was your mother's mother? My mother's mother. Yeah, right. Uh, and and she, all, all the others were dead? All the others were dead. And my, yeah. father's, my father's parents uh, would have died in, in, uh, in, in Poland uh, <laughs> many, 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 many years before. But my, my my grandmother came. My my grandmother came from. Uh, uh, my grandpa on my mother's side came from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and I, I believe my mother came from. Well, no, one of them came from Vienna, and the other came from a nearby town, which yeah. was I think in what is now Hungary, I suppose. Yeah. What date is this that you're talking about? Well, my father was born 1878, and my mother was born in 18. 1892 or thereabouts. So you have to go a generation back to their yeah. parents. And when were you born? I was born in 1907. And you went and visited this? When I was four or five, four or five I used to uh, be taken up there, I suppose when I was old as well. I did go and visit uh, uh, my grandmother and her her children, on a, her mm -hmm. sisters and brothers, my mother's brothers and sisters. But I always found it difficult because um, I mean, we were not, as it were, well off. I've described some of the living conditions in which we lived uh, um, during the war, but um, uh, I think it was much worse there. Mm. And I felt that we were really rather well off. It wasn't in terms of cash, but the, the kind of life was different. Mm. Um, and my family, my parents were, well, they had their rows, you know, but they were a very loving couple, and, and that. That reflected itself everywhere about my life. I was mm. aware of that, and I wasn't sure that this was true of all, all my mother's siblings. So I didn't really like going there. <laughs> <laughs> Not alone. <laughs> <laughs> was your family Orthodox, liberal, or non-practicing? 
No, they were. You see, they, they, I think uh, no, they were neither. No, certainly not liberal, uh, and they were not orthodox. And my father despised both groups. Um, he belonged to, I think, the, the, the Jewish community. I gather, so I have not been in it for a very long time. Uh, has many, many different streams, and I mm. think they were called sort of conservative. That is, they. Uh, you see, we didn't live in Birmingham in the Jewish community. My father and uh, and my mother had their business near the centre of town, opposite Snow Hill, to start with, uh, as my earliest memories, um, Snow Hill Station. And then they moved to Hansworth, which was quite a respectable place then, but it was a long way from the Jewish community. And whilst my brothers went to the Hebrew school, when the family lived in the centre of Birmingham, uh, there was no Hebrew school around for me to go to, and I went to the local school. So I didn't really mix with the Jewish community, and they were too far away from the synagogue to go, mm. except on high days and holy days, which there was an, a, a makeshift syn a synagogue behind, I think, a Methodist church. Uh, hmm. And the women sat in one row of benches, and the men and me being a boy went with my father next to a big cabinet which housed the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, that was just for the new Jewish New Year and the, uh, and the, uh, and the, um, oh, the, 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 um, the day on which we all were supposed to fast, Yom Kippur. Mm. But because I was a little boy, I didn't have to fast. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a long way. I mean, yeah, yeah. it seemed to be a long way, and we had, of course, to walk. So I didn't really come across... And your mother didn't give us a kosher kitchen or anything? Yes. Oh, she did? We, were, we did keep kosher, indeed. Yeah. Um, and this was to be a bit of a problem for me when later I was evacuated. But it, when I finally went to university, I realised it was... Well, I, I fell out with that tradition, but it was yeah. a, a gradual cut-off. Yeah. What are your memories of your primary school? Well, my primary school was next door to my home, and uh, Westminster Road Junior School it was, and uh, nothing very much. I, <coughs> nothing very remarkable happened there. I was slapped by the head and teach you once for being, for being a nuisance in the class, I remember. Nothing particularly. I suppose the not unhappy memories and not... You weren't bullied or you weren't... You were well, I was bullied, but then... Uh, but but I wasn't... And I never remember... Uh, I do not recall ever uh, any sign of anti-Semitism to me, mm. if, that, if, that's, if that were the question. Um, though my older brothers did experience it, I don't remember ever having mm. it. Um, but there were chaps around that bullied me, and uh, I, I used to... We used to fight in, in, the, mm. in the school playground. Did you bully others? I, I don't think I did, right? Because one doesn't know what. All I do remember being bullied by some. They were always bigger than me, and so the, the person that was big yes. was the bully, yes. and yes. they were really quite unpleasant. And I remember it was a terrible challenge to have to face up to them, which I had to do, you know. Yes. And, and one did in the school playground, and one was used to say by the teacher coming out with a great alarm. Yes. Uh, but um, apart from that, there was the interesting experience of. Um, my parents not wishing to me to be exposed to uh, the New Testament. And so I didn't go to the, the morning congregation at school. And while that was on, everyone was in the Great Hall. Uh, and I was sitting in the classroom that was off the hall. And then after the congregation, uh, there was religious studies, which of course was New Testament studies. Mm -hmm. And I then went into the hall and I sat by myself, looking around. And you were the only one? Well, you were the only one. I, mean, I was the only one. I yeah. was the only one in the school, and I, uh, I don't remember. I mean, clearly the fact that I remember this, uh, it, it may be of some significance. I don't remember being funny about it, though. I mean, I don't mm. remember going back in the class and being chastised. It was just, I suppose, for them, it was just like they went to the, the, the religious studies, and yes. Old Horn went up, and that was the way things were. But I don't remember anything adverse being associated with those men. And, the, and you weren't joined by the Catholics, or maybe there were no Catholics. So. No, there was. I was the only one that oh, I remember. Yes. You know, oh. I probably were no Catholics. Mm -hmm. When you failed the eleven plus, what happened that enabled you to get back into higher education? I mean, that was the. Oh, oh well. You see, the, the whole the whole business about f failing, which I I, I I really did fail. Um, uh, but you see, when I finished the primary school and the junior school. Um, 
there was a war, and I was evacuated for a time. I was evacuated for a few months, and uh, and I went to a nice school, but it was nothing. You couldn't do very much in the three months that I was there. And then I went back to Birmingham. The schools were all closed, and so my education then in Birmingham, uh, instead of going to the Birmingham Senior School, I went to the outlying class, which was a class held in the basement of a church, one hour a day. I don't know how many days a week. And that was our education. Um, I, I don't know how long it was before the school opened because I can't remember. But I finally, sorry, yes. I mean, you must have been eleven in nineteen thirty-eight, right? Yeah, I had. Yes, that's right. I, uh, yes, I'm sorry, that, I mean, it, eleven plus hadn't even come in at that point. That, I don't know what it was called. But it was the entrance the examination to the grammar school. Yeah. And I managed to get through that examination, but I didn't get a seat, which it seems to be to his tent about saying you failed the examination. Mm. Anyway, I didn't get a seat. And I, 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 uh, I, I don't know why. Um, Jewish holidays, a lot of them, ear, a lot of ear trouble, like middle ear infections. But I don't think that's the only explanation. I, I, I suspect I wasn't really interested. Yeah. But then how did you get over that? I mean, how did you get into well, grammar school? Well, uh, my, my next possibility, I didn't go to grammar school, my next possibility for anything outside the, the, uh, the ordinary state system was a technical school or a uh -huh. commercial school. My older brother had been to a commercial school. Uh, and you take that examination when you're 13. And I took it and I, 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 I managed to scrape in. Um, uh, and in my, in my first year I was pretty well close to the bottom of the class <laughs> in most things. Uh, we didn't do biology, by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty well close to the bottom of the class in maths, physics, um, and so on. And then in the second year, I don't know what happened in the second year, but I, I, it may have been an important moment. I, I remember the, um, the gym master, who was quite a, a, a major figure in the life of, 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 a, of, a, of a boy, was um, a, the, the games were cancelled, and uh, he took us into the classroom. He, he, of all people, read The Lady of Shalott. Well, of course, the culture from which I had come, people didn't read poetry. Mm. And here was this fellow who was the quintessence of, of physical skills and abilities, who was reading poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember, and that became indeed one of my favourite poems, and around about that time there must have been a turn around, because in my second year I suddenly switched from being bottom in maths to coming top in maths and top in physics. And I even almost remember the day when I was looking at the blackboard and the maths master, even in those days they wore a gown, and even in just a technical school they wore a gown, um, putting an equation on the board, and he had it transpose in algebra, a very simple equation, and that required trans, he had to transform the equation from one, one, one digit B was transformed, transferred from one side to the other. And I had never understood how, what the rules were about that, and I suddenly saw what he was doing, it was yeah. as it was a blinding incident, mm. and I suddenly saw what was going on, and really I, 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 I did improve, and I remember at the, as I was taking the final examination, the, the master came up behind me, the, the math master, who had been rather unpleasant to me when I was in my first year, he, he sort of sidled up to me and said, Horn, what are you going to do afterwards then, my boy? And I'd never heard him speak kindly to me before. So I thought, well, he says, oh, I must have done well in the exams, and indeed I had. Uh, so I still haven't answered your question, but the point is that there's a, there's a, there's a problem about answering the question in a simple way. Yes. Um, because I really wanted, uh, why did I go to technical school rather than commercial school? Because I wanted to be a civil engineer. Oh. I had seen in Arthur Mee's children's encyclopedia the bridge over the Victoria Falls, and I thought, that's what I want to do. I want to build bridges in Africa. And I was persuaded then, technical school, civil engineering, yeah. that was for me. And uh, after I left school, I applied to Stuart and Lloyd's in Birmingham for a job, and they didn't give it to me. And, and it was, this was what age? This was when I was 15, because I left school when I was 15. And it, over that summer, uh, I applied for this job, and then I, my father got a job for me in a, as a draftsman in a big engineering company. I stayed that for a week and I thought it was an awful job. You saw serried <laughs> ranks of people behind drawing boards and standing up all day long working away on their drawing boards. And I thought that was ghastly, so I left. And at that time, my older brother, 
uh, Henry had been called up. He was the last of the three to be called up into the armed forces. He'd worked for my father. My father was getting quite ill. He needed help. And so he asked me to help him as a tailor and in the shop, because that's what he wanted me to be. He wanted me yeah. to be a tailor, you see. He saw there was not much hope, but but he, he, I said, all right, I'll do this as long as I can get, get off one day a week and go to a technical college to become study the National Certificate of Mechanical Engineering as a route to becoming an, an engineer. Then we agreed on that. Um, so uh, dur during that time uh, that I was doing the National Certificate, which was a two-year course, I was also going to youth clubs, all sorts of youth clubs in the evening, and wasting my time in the youth clubs. And in one of them, there was, there, there was a, a, a woman who was supposed to look after us. And we were fooling around in the outer room, a, a large hall of a school, with a table tennis table, you know, mm -hmm. playing table tennis. And the classrooms were off the central hall. And uh, you could see through them, through glass windows. And there was this elderly, gentle, kind, woman that was supposed to be keeping discipline uh, and she was sitting on a child's chair desk reading from a book with a few few young young people around her sitting listening to her and I thought I wonder what she's reading to them and it was uh, uh, Huxley well uh, Wells Huxley and Wells the science of life mm. And I sat there, and that really was the, 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 the moment that was, I think, almost decisive. Uh, almost almost mm. decisive. Because you've got the Arthur and me looking at these, bri these bridges, you see. And, the, and then, then, then when I heard this extraordinary story of biology, and I knew nothing of biology, I was trapped, really. And uh, I, I, I said I'd like to... I wasn't quite sure whether how I came to read medicine, but I, I had thought that medicine was a nice thing to do because you could help people. Mm. That was very strongly the reason. The other reason, there was no one to tell me what I should do yes. if I wanted to study biology. And there was another problem, and the other problem was that to study bi biology or get into university to do medicine or whatever, one had to have the lum uh, a matriculation examination. Mm -hmm. That was... First MB. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. The equivalent of GCSEs Today was right. your first step in entering the University of London or yes. Birmingham, of course. That was called a matriculation examination. Right. Um, and then when you had taken the matriculation examination, you had to, if you wanted to be excused the first MB, you had to take the higher school certificate, I think it was. And so I decided that notwithstanding all the great challenges, I thought I was going to do this. This is what I was going to do anyway. So I asked my father and my mother, and I could see they were rather pleased. I remember sitting on the on the pressing table, <laughs> and, and 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 my mother sitting there, my father standing up, and, and 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 he was obviously pretty tickled pink that I was thinking of becoming a doctor. Uh, but he said, you know, you you really, you I'm not sure it's a good idea for you to do that because you you really want to be a tailor, <laughs> because uh, if you're a tailor, you can get you can earn a living anywhere in the world, and you're your own man. You work whenever you wish. And I remember thinking how hollow that was, the working wherever you wish, because my father worked long hours, up at seven, working in the, sh uh, in the mm. workshop, half past seven, working till seven or eight at night, and working on Sundays as well. Mm. So he worked, not Saturdays, but he worked a seven day mm. week, and mm. it was dreadful to see this man working all the time, mm. but he, was, he, he deceived himself into believing he mm. was a free man, and. Mm. Uh, and, and, and emancipated from the demands of other people, and the doctors were not. But anyway, he, he said, yes, all right, I'll do what I can to support you, which of course in those days it meant finding the cash. Because you weren't earning, of course. Yeah. But, but I was working for him. You were working for him? I was then working for yeah. him, yeah. and so instead of going to the, I stopped the tech, and I went to night school. No, I didn't go to night I went to this lovely woman who was a teacher in biology. I never knew her name. Um, at the local King Edward's School, Grammar School for Girls in Hamsworth, Birmingham. I tried to find her name out afterwards, but I've never been able to find her name. <laughs> and I went to see her in her home, and she said, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you, I can arrange teachers to, you 
I had to learn a new language, I had mm -hmm. to learn different kind of mathematics, I had to learn a number of subjects for, um, for the London of trick. Uh, but, but there weren't many months, this was about February I should think, and the exams were next June. And this was of course at least a two year course, and, and it was also five shillings an hour that I had to pay to her colleagues of course, and it was very expensive for my parents. Mm. So I realised it was fruitless, went back to hoots of laughter from my colleagues at the School of Technical School College, you know, when I was doing mechanical engineering, the National Certificate mm. of Mechanical Engineering class. They thought it was there because clearly I wasn't serious about medicine. They'd all thought I was going to be eager enough to be a doctor. Well, well, I stuck with it and I did quite well in those exams. And then in the coming September I went to night school. Mm. And during, as I intended to do that in, in one year, mm -hmm. so it was a two-year course, so I had to accelerate it somehow to get it into one year. And in the following January of that year, my father died. Mm -hmm. So there was a serious problem, not only in the death of my father, whom I, of course, dearly loved, mm -hmm. um, but in the fact there had to be a breadwinner. Yeah. Um, and we had the shop. Um, and what we did, we went on selling clothes, and because I could, I used to, my father taught me how to make uh, parts of women's clothes, and I was good at making skirts. <laughs> I was very good at making skirts, yes. <laughs> uh, but I couldn't make jackets, they were, they were two-piece suits in those days. Yeah. And uh, so I put a, a sign up in the shop saying, alterations made, I was quite good at selling, and that was a great skill for me later in microsurgery, by the way, I think. Uh, yeah. It was it, it invaluable, sure. that skill. So mm -hmm. I sewed, and I took in alterations and pressed garments, um, and that brought in a living. Um, but I still kept on, you see. I mm -hmm. still went on at night school, managed to get the matric in the, in, in, in the following June, and then embarked on doing my A-levels. My A-levels, well, you know, the equivalent of A-levels, yes. uh, chemistry, physics, and biology. And well, you were was, 17 now, were you also? I must have been, yes, I was coming up, yes, I was, I was coming up to 18. Yeah. Uh, I was kept between 17 and 18. Yeah. Uh, and um, then it was a two-year course, and somehow I had to contrive to do it all in one year. Um, and I was doing this work. It sounds dreadful. I actually, it was a, a, an extraordinarily exciting year for me when I discovered the things I did yeah. discover, as I learned. Um, but I was due to be called up to the armed forces when I was 18. And I, I, I asked for deferment, for, there was no war on of course, I asked for deferment until I finished the exams and they were refused. They gave me a short deferment and refused to extend me to the following July. So I wrote to my MP <laughs> and my MP wrote to the Minister of War or Defence, I think it changed to no. Mr. Arthur Henderson. Oh, yes. And uh, I, after many weeks I received a letter saying that Mr. Henderson could not interfere with the course of this call-up. But it was unlikely that it would be implemented in time for it to interfere with Mr. Horne's examinations. And many, many years later I met Mr. Arthur Henderson in the House of Lords. And I, I, met, I was at next, sat next to him at lunch and I told him the story. I remember you, he said. I don't believe he did, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I remember you, he said, we thought it was a neat solution. <laughs> so anyway, I got my A-levels uh, then, you know, and yes. I got the standard. And I should say there was a very, very peculiar twist to all this, because when I decided to read medicine, I didn't know who to turn to for advice, apart from this teacher mm. who was very good, but I knew nothing about medicine. So I, I simply wrote to the, the sub-dean of the medical school at Birmingham. A Mr. Professor Charles Smout, C.F.V. Smout, and he he very kindly received me, received me, but he was quite violent. I mean, he was angry. As, I don't know why he chose to see me, but he was. Why was I wasting his time? I hadn't got any quali qualification, which I had. I hadn't even started the matriculation really? course. Why was I wasting his time? You give up this thing. It's a ridiculous idea. And I, he wrote me a letter, which I have actually, which said. Um, it was an absurd idea, just give it up, you don't stand a chance. Uh, nonetheless, some years later, when I got my national certificate, and I got my matric, and I got the A-levels, the higher schools, I asked to see him again. And he agreed to see me. Whereupon, he 
upbraided me once more, and I can't think why I upbraided me once And he shouted at me and banged the table, and he said, get up, get up. So I, 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 I got up to go up, and I was carrying a little briefcase. He said, what have you got in there? So I said, it's, well, my certificate. My certificate. So I said, well, come here, he said. So I came back. And I showed him these certificates. And he said words that said, my dear boy, why didn't you show them to me? <laughs> of course you can have a place to read medicine. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so that was the history of, of my uh, reading medicine. So when I came, yes. I was given a place in medicine. Can I, I, I mean, this is slightly to one side, but I mean, you, you, I always think of you as being sort of on the left of, of, of English politics, I mean, how, but, but it was obviously some, a change from your family background. I mean, how, do you remember how you sort of, your, your, your sense about politics changed? Was that sort of, did that coincide with, with your interest in, in doing something for other people? Well, I, I, you see, there was no, politics weren't discussed in my family. My mother uh, said she was liberal, but I didn't know what that meant. Um, uh, I really didn't know what it meant, and my father, uh, we, we, politics was never an issue in mm. my house. It absolutely was not an issue. Mm. Um, I remember, of course, when I was an undergraduate, um, I, I met Anne Soper um, in the... I met her on the first day at the University of Birmingham, but uh, we only saw each other at a distance, but in our last year we began to go yeah. walking out together, as it were, and, 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 uh, and we talked a great deal about politics. By that time, I was extremely interested. I should say that there may have been a number of factors, but it was not family background. Mm. It was that when in those years of enlightenment for me, when I had um, decided to, to read medicine, and decided in part because I also, not only influenced by this woman, but my mind was opened by that book. Mm. Um, and then I began to look for other books, um, and in particular I began to look toward philosophy. And the, the, I remember reading a book by C. E. M. Jode. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, he, he, uh, all sorts of criticisms have been levelled at him, of course, and he, I suppose, was not a great and distinguished philosopher, but he was a wonderful communicator, mm. and he wrote a book called A Guide to Philosophy. Mm. And that was really what brought a huge change in me intellectually. I mean, then I began to see that solid things weren't really solid and uh, what I thought was really red was something very subjective and uh, the world of my senses was not really the world of physics um, and, and that was extraordinary and you, you've got to realise how extraordinary it was because because with my background at that school which was a jolly good school mm. in, in, uh, for a, 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 a training it was a training for skilled artisans it was a train for skilled artisans. If you did an experiment in physics, if you got the answer wrong, you knew it was be you hadn't discovered a new principle. It was because you hadn't done the experiment properly. If you got the uh, if you got the wrong answer in mathematics, it was because you got done set about the wrong way because the answer was in the at the end of the book. And so the whole world for me was a closed world. All the answers were known. Mm -hmm. But if if only I knew who knew it. there would be answers and you didn't have to bother about looking further. Mm. But it was when I discovered that book, then went on to Bertrand Russell, I came across Einstein and Felt in, 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 um, in physics, where they explained Einstein's theory of relativity. relativity. It's a wonderful book. Um, I, um, I came across A.J. Ayer's Language, Truth and Logic. And all these things were happening to me as, you know, sense as a result of this lovely woman reading, reading this book and then suddenly opening up my mind. And it was, I suppose, at that time I was not only seeing the social conditions of people, becoming more and more aware of them. In my a course at the university, a little later on, there was a course in social medicine. One saw the infinite poverty that was around you. Anne Soper was the daughter of Donald Soper, who was, of course, a a very left-wing politician, mm. Christian politician. Well, I certainly wasn't by then a Christian. By then, I was an agnostic. Mm. Um, but I was more and more conscious of the needs of the underprivileged mm. and the un injustices of the 
distribution of resources in the country and the waste to a country of young people who were had to go these devious routes mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. discover themselves. Whereas to others who went to the right school, it was given. Mm -hmm. Good, it should be. It should be drawn out by the school, but there was a, mm -hmm. the vast majority of children, nothing was there to draw mm -hmm. them out. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I still believe that to be not entirely changed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think those are the factors that drove me to left the politics. Mm -hmm. When did you start to develop an interest in the brain? Was that, was that at Birmingham? Well, yes, it was in Birmingham. It, it was during those years as well, you see, because mm -hmm. I was beginning to be aware of, of perception and sensation, the philosophical yes. issues around that and consciousness, even then. Um, and I remember one day, uh, it was in 1946, reading a book, uh, a magazine called Discovery. It was like New Scientist Today. And it had on uh, an article on the brain, a, a two or three articles on the surgery of the brain. And it was that moment that I knew I wanted to work on the brain. It was, mm. it was, uh, I mean, I thought it would be surgery in the event it was, it was not to be surgery, it didn't want to do that. But that and the philosophical background was driving me towards the central nervous system at an early stage. What was it like at Birmingham then? The university? Yes. Well, well, I had a wonderful time, and it was, I probably had this disgracefully good time. <laughs> uh, um, I, I mean, <coughs> I, I just plunged into the university, into an undergraduate life, mm. and I got involved in the University Debating Society, which was also, and, I, and, and, and at the end of the first year, for some reason, they, they asked me to be chairman of the, debating, the University Debating Society, and that made me also chairman of the political society. Mm. So I, I had to chair meetings of the Conservatives, the Liberals, the Socialists, and, you know, and, and, and also run debates and speak at debates. Um, so that first year was a, a great year for exploring beyond the bounds of anatomy and physiology. Mm. Um, and I think to some extent that was also through the second year. But the third year was a fabulous year before, because I, I was, uh, the third year we didn't have a part two. In, 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 medicine. In, in medicine, there was no, it was a two year course in clinical medicine. But some students could take an examination for a scholarship, uh, of which I think there were two, to get an award to spend a third year doing a Bachelor of Science degree in anatomy and physiology. And I had by then really become interested, a really by, by handling the brain of the second year medical student yeah. was an extraordinary experience. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's, I think it's one that every medical student <laughs> ought to experience. It's, it is truly a remarkable experience. Um, and that reinforced all the prejudices I'd built up about working on the nervous system. And d during that year I was learning about it. We mm -hmm. didn't know a lot at that time about the nervous system, but I was learning a lot about it at that time. Uh, so I, I really wanted to do this l last year, and there was this remarkable figure in the medical school called Solly yes. uh, and, 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 and he was remarkable because even he was professor of anatomy, but we never saw him really as professor of anatomy. He, uh, anatomy was taught by everybody but Solly Zuckerman. He, he was um, in London a good deal of the time advising governments about defence and, mm. and, uh, and, and general scientific issues. Um, but his presence was felt to them. He used to come on Fridays and stay until Monday. And somehow, on, in the medical school, on Friday afternoon, the whole atmosphere changed. It was as if the, 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 the field marshal had turned up. And although he wasn't present in other departments, everyone was, was alert. And they remained alert until Monday afternoon. <laughs> when some of them relaxed a little bit <laughs> more. So there was this remarkable figure as well, and I knew that it, I could work in the Department of Anatomy with a very small group, and it was his department. Yes. And they were working on the brain, so quite a lot of work going on brain and neuroendocrinology. So I, I took this exam, and I managed to get a scholarship, and, and I worked there, and, and there was only a few lectures. I think there was only one course of lectures. The rest was the dissertation. And that was the reason when, in fact, I came back to Cambridge to the Department of Zoology later on, if I'm jumping the bunker, mm -hmm. um, I was so keen to get a project. This mm -hmm. was a research project into the third yes. year because that research project was, for me, the most 
one of the most exciting years mm. of my life. Mm. It was also the year I met Anne and, 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 and married Anne as well. Um, in that year? Yeah, in that year, but yes, it was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I was pretty certain that when, it was, we were both in our third year, and I was pretty certain that when Anne went down, you know, we broke up and I stayed on to do, with medicine, and Anne went back to London, that the pressure on her family would be such as to pull us apart. What was she reading? Zoology. That's right. I mean, she's the one that helped me with my zoological knowledge. She was, she was mm. and she was a wonderful naturalist as well. Mm. She, 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 she simply did love nature. Mm. And uh, is this so Sopa or Sopa and Sopa. Mm. So, I, I had decided the only way to be sure that I could marry Anne was to marry her before she went down. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, and we connived to marry each other. Without telling anybody, um, and we got married the day after our first paper in the final examination. Yeah. <laughs> did, so, did Donald know about this? No, no, no. Donald and, and Mari, his wife, didn't know about this for many, many, many years. It was it was a closely kept secret. <laughs> <laughs> it was a closely kept secret. <laughs> but I'm pretty certain they would have they would have opposed the marriage. I mean, after all, I. I had I had no background. I had no money. I had, I mean, really, uh, and, and 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 they had aspirations in the sense that all the uh, all the daughters went to Queenswood, and they all were very middle class English, and mm. I was hardly middle class <laughs> and only just English. Just <laughs> <laughs> can I just go back to Solly because he's sometimes written about as a kind of extremely dis disagreeable man in some ways, and trampling on people, and and also when he arrived, very snobbish. I mean, did, did any of that sort of uh, become apparent to you, or do you? Well, uh, I, I I I loved Solly. I mean, and, yeah. and it's well known among Solly's enemies that I loved Solly. <laughs> um, Solly was very much a father figure to me. Uh, I mean, it really, he was. And uh, in fact, when I I got this scholarship to do the BSC uh, year. Um, I also got an opportunity to go representing Britain in the debating society in an all India tour. And this was, you know, I'd never been abroad. Not really. I'd been to France once. But I never, this was a fantastic opportunity and I wanted to go to India. What year is this? This was 1951. And but of course I was starting this BSc course and I really didn't know what to do. It would have made, it was a six, six weeks visit through October and November. Um, so I went to the department and I went to see a man, a very nice man, called Peter Crow, who was a distinguished endocrinologist. And he was Solly's right hand man. And he said, well I don't think I can advise you what to do, because I said, what do I do? I mean, I really, I want to do both. He said, well, um, I think you'd better see the professor. So, sure enough, this extraordinary busy man, he, he was he was in abroad, he mm. came and he saw me. And uh, and he was he was quite robust, he was a very robust person. Mm. He was like a, a whirlwind, uh, sitting down, one felt he was like a whirlwind. And, but he had time and never gave me the sense that I was taking up his time. Um, and he said, well, look, if you do well, You'll be able to travel around the world as much as you like. Don't do it now. Stick with it. Good advice. Which, of course, exactly was exactly right. And and indeed, I really when I during that year I did a lot of research, mm -hmm. and then I was to go on to clinical work. And um, I really wanted to keep doing research. And, and I had to do that in the Department of Anatomy because mm. that was where my research base was. Mm. But I was also supposed to be attending ward rounds. Mm. And I was absenting myself from ward rounds and the Professor of Surgery, Professor Stammers, apparently contacted Zuckerman and said, you know, this, is, this won't do. And Zuckerman put out an instruction that said, Horn uh, must not be encouraged to stay in a laboratory. But you don't have to discourage him either. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, and 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 uh, and uh, there was that in him. And indeed, later on, there was. A, I really didn't want to come to Cambridge. I wanted to stay in his department. And um, <clears throat> uh, I went to see him about this. 
and he hadn't got a job for me. This is when you were qualified? No, I was still coming up to qualification. Yes, yes. I had decided I want to stay in medicine. Yes, I've yes. been publishing some papers, neuroendocrinology. Uh, I published a number of papers by then. Yes. Um, and he said, well, look, I'll, I'll, I'll write to my friend Dixon Boyd at Cambridge. And you can stay here while I dictate the letter. I don't know whether that was a letter that went, by the way. But it was a very glowing letter. It was a very nice letter. And so that was my entry. The, a, a job finally came up at Cambridge. And Boyd wrote and said, are you going to apply? So that's, that's how I, I got into Cambridge. Um, but I did... So I, you went straight from when you were qualified as a doctor to, to go to, into research in Cambridge? Was no, I, I did my clinical jobs. I did. I, you had to... Uh, I, I thought I'd, I'd spent five or six years studying medicine. And uh, now a new rule had been introduced into, that required you to um, spend a year at a hospital mm. uh, uh, t in order to get registered, you, yes. you, you, in order to be on the general medical yes. register. And I thought, well, I spent all these years uh, doing all these years, yes. uh, uh, not wasting my time, but uh, uh, in medicine, I might as well finish it off, which is what I did. And I still went on doing research. Then, yes. doing, I used to, I don't know, I'm a poor wife and children suffer. I don't know how they put up with it, but I, I still managed to do some research then. Um, and that, that was the time also when I was beginning to think really what I wanted to do. What would I do in future research? That was what would be my plan of action when I finally left medicine yes. and went into research. And when you came to the Department of Anatomy here, or at least, I mean, that's going back a step, I mean, you applied for that job. I applied for the job, yeah. Uh, and, uh, I mean, was your intention to then go whole time into research? Uh, yes, it was. I, yeah. I, I, di I did, but it was, I, was, I was again still, I still clung because, to medicine because I used to, <laughs> uh, um, to eke out a living, uh, I, I, I was used to supervise, and yes, I used to yes. supervise quite a lot for, for King. Yes. That's how I began my early days with King. But um, I also found I could earn almost as much, not quite as much as supervising, by doing the, um, the surgery for the local GP in Histon. So uh, one or two evenings a week, I used to open the door at six o'clock at the Histon surgery and close it at eight o'clock. Uh, and sometimes when he went away, uh, and he's a one 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 man band as it were, he's an awfully nice man, this doctor. Uh, but he needed some time off, and I would, he'd asked me to stay in, stand in for him over the weekend. So I stand, I stood in for him over the weekend, and occasionally I uh, that got to be known by a local doctor, and I was asked if I'd do the odd week or two locum in the fens, which I did. I used to go out and, <laughs> while as a demonstrator and. I don't know whether I was a lecturer still, but certainly as a demonstrator, I used to go out in the fence and deliver babies and, you know, attend to people with terrible illnesses in the middle of the night. So I, I really, I kept this association going until finally I realised that I was actually, there were plenty of people to do good, that actually I was getting a bit bored with the coughs and sneezes, mm -hmm. the coughs and colds, people coming in and mm -hmm. saying the same thing, how are you? Well, I'm all right, Doctor. How are you? And and, and it took a long time to penetrate through yeah. to what was really wrong with them. And I thought, really, other people can do this. I want to get on with my research. So I focused more and more, right. and more on my right. research. What work did you want to do in the in the department? Well, you see, again, I think there was this huge influence from my philosophical interests. Um, I had been thinking about consciousness and how one could possibly um, tackle that. Uh, 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 from an experimental point of view. And I, I, I became aware, uh, possibly not self-generated awareness, but possibly by others and by the reading, that the one thing that you're, you're confident about when, you th when you're, you are, you, you're aware, there are certain things that are going on in the world you, you're not aware of mm -hmm. at all. Uh, and then somehow you can switch and become aware of them and switch off the other piece. So clearly there's something selective about perception. You attend to some things, you don't attend to other, other things. And the things to which you do attend, then are, as it were, apprehended in a self-conscious way. Mm. The other things tend not, you're not aware of them. So it seemed to me that if you could understand how the different signals are treated in the nervous system, the attended signals and the unattended signals, you could find the roots 
by which the attendant signals are passed and treated in the brain and then see how that differs from the unattended signal and then you could switch the signal so the one becomes attended and the other so you play this game and it's, it seemed to me that was this, a potential attack on the problem of consciousness from an experimental point of view. I'd come across uh, Adrian's work hey, uh, you see, uh, there were already some neuro, neurophysiological correlates of this mm -hmm. because um, Berger, uh, that is Hans Berger in 1928, when he studied the human electroencephalogram, he found that there's a rhythm at the back of the, of the skull that you can record called the alpha rhythm. Mm -hmm. the, uh, those oscillations, electrical oscillations at 10 a second. And they disappear if the subject is attending to a stimulus, but they reappear if the subject isn't attending to a stimulus. Uh, that's, that is, it, it, if they attend, they, they disappear. If the subject is relaxed, they, 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 come, they come back again. So there's something going on in the brain that was quantifiable. Mm. And Adrian was able to repeat these. Adrian Matthews, uh, Matthews was of course... Is a, Adrian the surname or the... Uh, Lord Adrian. Lord, Lord Adrian. Lord Adrian. Adrian. Yep. Uh, Adrian and Brian Matthews. Brian mm. Matthews was here. And they, together they were able to replicate and take forward those, that work of Berger in some very elegant experiments in the 1930s. Adrian then became, was a sensory physiologist. He was interested in the way signals are passed from, from the skin, say, along nerve fibers up to the brain. What's the mechanism? And he, of course, discovered the kind of nerve impulses that we used and the codes for signaling nerve impulses, and he got the Nobel Prize in 1932, I think. Well, Adrian had thought about this, and he wondered whether signals that are not attended to are blocked in being transmitted from the eye to the brain, mm. or, well, or from the skin to the brain. It's an old idea, it had been about for, since 1904, certainly, possibly longer. And I thought it was a great thing to do, and so my intention was to come to Cambridge and set up an electrophysiological laboratory and study attention with electrodes, electrophysiologically, in, in animals, in behaving animals. Uh, but there wasn't anyone in Cambridge that was studying the neurophysiology of the central nervous system. There were some neurophysiological studies uh, on the retina being conducted, Horace Barlow, Giles Brindley, um, uh, but n nothing in the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. And there was very little in Britain going on at all. Um, and, and so, I, I, I thought, well, I'd better be trained somewhere. Mm. I've got to learn how to do mm. this. So I, I, I asked Professor Boyd if I could have... This was my first year, you see, mm -hmm. and, and I asked Professor Boyd if I could take a year's leave off the next year and go to work with Herbert Jasper. And mm. he, he, Penfield was a great neurosurgeon, you may have heard yeah, of him. Yes, of and he, he established this a huge... Uh, Institute of Neurology, the Montreal Neurological mm. Institute, which was very, very eminent uh, in those days. Mm. And Herbert Jasper was a neurophysiologist working on electrical recording from the brain. And um, I thought, I wrote to him, and he said, yes, well, yes, you can come if you can get the money. So I applied for some cash, and I, um, and Dixon Boyd said, well, you can go, but I can't pay you, because you've only been here for one year, and I, you, have to, you can have unpaid leave of absence. So I applied to, I think it was a welcome trust, and it was a, it was wonderful because I got the I got the grant. And the the person that was on the committee, and again met, met many years afterwards, was the the son of a he may have been a Kingsman, Henry Barcroft. Oh yes. Uh, I wasn't then really at Kings, you know. He did. No. I, I was a Birmingham no. man, and so was absolutely <laughs> no influence there. But um, but he thought he said I thought this was a good grant application, and I approved it. So uh, I went to, uh, was going to go, and, and Herbert uh, knew Adrian, Herbert Jasper knew E.D. Adrian, and asked Adrian if he'd see me. So I got a little note from Adrian saying, yeah, dear Horn, I should be glad to see you in my laboratory at 11 o'clock, it was 11, I don't know, one morning. So I went across to see him, and he was simply wonderful. Uh, he was then Master of Trinity, and mm. of course, was the great, he was the eminence grise in the world. Mm. 
And there he was, he was in his downstairs room, it was blacked out, basement of the Department of Physiology, all blacked out, uh, so you could take photographs on the oscilloscope screen. Mm. And um, uh, he was filing something, he got something in advice and he was filing away. And he said, sit down, and there was a, there was a tub, a, 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 a box of some sort, upturned, he said, sit down. And I sat down, and we spent the next an hour and a half to two hours speaking about attention. And he was filing away, and we were talking. Um, I should say that it was, you know, funny. I did want to mention this because it's reminiscent of another experience I had of, of, of meeting someone that was so august as to be, um, as, you know, in a different mm. planet from mine. And that was A. J. Eyre. Um, uh, I'd written an essay uh, on on uh, neurological basis mm. of thought. I think you know about it. And always mm. smile when I tell you about mm. it. <laughs> but um, I, I wrote this essay, and and uh, Zuckerman. I was in Zuckerman's. That was my year uh, in the Bachelor of Science degree at Birmingham. I did. I wrote it then, and and Zuckerman read it, and he sent it off to air. And Air said he'd like to see me. Um, so I went to see Air. I mean, this was fantastic experience. You, mm. you remember, this is Birmingham. You don't really have any contact with with uh, with, with supervisors mm, as right. you do in, in here in Cambridge. This is another aspect of Solly. Sol Sol you see that he took the trouble to read this thing. He not only read it in draft form, but he read Heb H E double B all over my manuscript. Heb 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 about uh, is one of the most famous uh, theoretical neurobiologists that exists today. And he had published in 1949 a, a paper on how memory might work. And all unbeknown to me, I had written in my essay a, th a theory of how memory worked, which in fact was almost exactly the same as Hebb's. But I hadn't heard of Hebb's. I didn't know, I didn't know whether Hebb was an anti chiffer or a noun. <laughs> I couldn't really understand uh, 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 was writing. Or anyway, a swear word. But, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know any of that. <laughs> but, uh, but I did go and see yeah. uh, and, 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 and he, he was, I, did, uh, I saw him in his apartment at Mayfair. That was a funny experience. Up a rickety old flight of stairs, knocked on the door, and there was this very elegantly dressed man standing at the top, come in, he said. And he was very elegantly dressed. He chain smoked. He walked up and down, and sat me down uh, an armchair, uh, a, big, a, a big chair and harangued me about how wrong I was. <laughs> <laughs> and that physiology had nothing to say about sensory perception. And I occasionally would draw attention to what Bertrand Russell had said, and that only inflamed <laughs> him all the more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it was, it was a wonderful experience. Mm. Um, um, but it, no, that was, a, in, in, a, in a way, it was a complex experience mm. for, for me, uh, as well as meeting Adrian, and being encountered by him. Did Adrian know about those experiments where somebody is attending to one voice and then somebody somewhere else says his name and though he's not attending to that other person, then... Yes, in fact, Adrian, Adrian didn't uh, refer to those particular experiments, but I remember one of the ex uh, uh, sort of anecdotal bits of information, uh, evidence that he, he uh, evinced for the blocking idea, was um, uh, he said, the doctor... Um, a, uh, uh, a sleep at night does not often hear the call of his child crying in, 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 in the cradle nearby, but he will wait for the ringing of the telephone. Or other examples, or oh, the mother won't wait for the ringing of the telephone, but she wait for the cry of the child, and people will uh, m m more respond to the name if it's if it's uh, if, if it precedes. Because that's all evidence against blocking, isn't it? Uh, well, it, it means there's monitoring, and it means yes. there's, 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 you get rid of, you don't want the, you don't, you are selectively blocking the signals you will not be wanting. Mm -hmm. So the doctor doesn't want to hear the baby's cry, cry, and he blocks it out somehow, allowing some, well, I, I, I don't know whether he called them SOS messages, but I certainly call them SOS messages, that uh, there are some SOS messages that, uh, mayday, mayday messages, I suppose, um, that are still allowed through. So it can't be a complete block, no, but there is some sort of block. Mm. I was teaching, see, I began to teach for Kings in 1956, as soon as I arrived in 56. <coughs> um, so 56 and 57, I was around, and I was doing mm. some supervising, but I don't know how, I can't remember much about that. 57, 58, I went away. 
I think I was supervising in 56, 57 for Kings, actually. Because I came back to some of my supervisees, so I guess I was. And then uh, in 58, Kings really asked me if I'd take on all the supervision, um, which, which I did. Um, but I was still only a demonstrator, and I, I didn't know that at this mm. time, but the uh, college were reluctant to take on university officers who were a demonstrator, which we call them assistant lecturers today, of course. Mm. Um, uh, uh, but they did offer me very generous, very generous dining rights. Very generous dining rights. I could reminisce about, reminiscence, sorry, reminisce about that in my first exchange with Prof. Shepherd. But, um, but uh, I, I, I exercise those dining rights. I hope you will reminisce about Robert Shepherd. Well, I mean, yes, he, he, was, he was quite extraordinarily nice to me. I, I, I remember the very first evening coming into the college, having been given dining rights. It was a summer evening, and I had come in much too early. I think it was about 7 o'clock. Dinner, of course, yeah. at 7.30. And there was only one person there. And the person was hidden behind a newspaper, but it had small legs, that's all I could remember. <laughs> uh, and I went and sat opposite at the other end of the room. And um, suddenly, um, almost convulsively, the paper was crashed down onto the lap. Because I was reading the paper then, this news, this paper was crashed down. Who are you? <laughs> came this voice. I said, I'm Gabriel Horn. Who are you? And he thought this was the most wonderful thing he'd ever heard. Everybody should know about Prophet Shepherd, you <laughs> see. And he was, I say, who are you? And after that, he was always extraordinarily nice to me. Um, I remember on one occasion, you see, coming to Cambridge from Birmingham, both practicing medic, I was called doctor, doctor, everything was doctor. I came to Cambridge, and I, of course, only had an MB, and that mm -hmm. was an MB, Bachelor of Medicine degree, and that was a Bachelor of Medicine degree from Birmingham, not from Cambridge. So mm -hmm. there was little justification for calling me doctor, so I was called Mr. But there was one wonderful occasion when there was a dinner in Hall, it was some special dinner, I can't remember, and I'd been placed next to Prophet Shepherd, and I saw on the card, it said, Dr. Horn. And I said to Prophet Shepherd, who was sitting down, um, Provost, um, this says doctor, and I'm only a mister. You see, I learnt my place by there. And he said, My dear boy, he said, You're the only proper doctor in this college. <laughs> 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 but to come to John Griffin. Well, I, I, I met John dining in Hall. I mean, yeah. uh, that was, was where I met him. And um, well, I, I talked to him about my, my work, and I was then, um, uh, I, I'd, I'd come back from the States. Uh, from Canada, and fortunately applied for and, and received a very substantial sum of money from the National Institutes of Health in the States. Mm. Uh, and that enabled me to really set up a, a first-class neurophysiological laboratory, which mm. was very expensive in those days, mm. with the help and uh, encouragement of Professor Boyd, who was a classical anatomist and thought this was, I come from, again, a different planet. Who was this chap who wanted to do electrophysiology mm. department? But he was very sweet. Give me, gave me space. Well, I got this money and I was recording from nerve cells in the cerebral cortex and I was telling John Griffith about this and he said, I'd love to come see what you do. And he came across to my laboratory and I, I showed him what I did and he was absolutely fascinated. He, of course, was a mathematician and he was a theoretical chemist mm. and he'd never, they'd never, I think, thought about the nervous system actually. Uh, he then would come frequently, and I remember he would, he would come in with almost invariably with a tightly rolled umbrella. He was a very shy person, mm. and, 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 and very upright, and, <laughs> and rather unsure of himself, really. Mm. Sure about his science, but very, very, very diffident. Mm. But he would come in and see me when I was doing experiments, and we would watch the oscilloscope screen together. And sometimes, you can tell whether you are recording from a single nerve cell. There are you know, hundreds of millions of nerve cells in the brain, but you can tell whether you're recording from one because the, the cell generates an electrical current and you can measure that, the voltage that's associated with it. And the voltage generates a wave that you can see on the oscilloscope. It's got a particular form. 
any one neuron has a particular wave front waveform. If you move your electrode, you will lose that neuron and pick up another waveform. Mm. And sometimes we could see on the oscilloscope there was one waveform accompanied by another little waveform, which had to mean it was two neurons, because each waveform was consistent pattern. Mm. And I remember John saying, John had said to me, you see, uh, provocatively at uh, a dinner one day, uh, he'd been reading some work by um, Eccles, I think, uh, a great neurophysiologist, and he said, if if you can tell me how all the neur how, how neurons work in the brain, I'll tell you how the brain works. Hmm. And of course, those were the days when it was thought there was only one kind of neuron, and that's the neuron in the spinal cord, and you can extrapolate from that to every single neuron in the brain. Uh, that was not John's fault. That was a, that was a fault of the neurophysiological community uh, uh, because that was all we knew. And um, so he saw these. He saw these two neurons popping away. You can hear them as well as see them. And he thought, uh, I, I think it was him. How interesting that because these are two neurons, and I, I said these are probably two neurons. And they must be close together, because if you move the electrode a small distance, a few microns, a few thousandths of a millimeter, you, 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 you pick up different neurons. Mm. How do they interact with each other? Mm. 